Hello, and uh, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Shepard, and I'm the curator of the Toward the Sentient City exhibit. Um, and I'm just going to very quickly um, give a brief, brief introduction and I'm turn it over to the breakout team uh, who have uh, lightning presentations to give us. Um, and so I'll try to make this a lightning uh, introduction. Um, <laughs> Basically, um, uh, these guys have been probably working harder than any of us over the last week. Um, a series of breakout events, which if you go to breakoutfestival.org, um, you can find out uh, the calendar of these events and, um, and possibly sign up and uh, participate uh, in this project. Uh, just quickly, a few acknowledgments. I clearly want to be able to uh, thank the Architectural League of New York and Particularly the J. Clausen Mills Fund, which provided uh, the funding which made possible the five commissions for the exhibition. Um, uh, the uh, person just what, trying to sit in here right now is Greg Rester, the director of the exhibition. Uh, obviously, without his <laughs> dedication, patience, and dedication, none of this would be happening. Um, Firstly, Ginevra, the executive director of the Architectural League. Whose continuous support from the sidelines in the background uh, has been uh, awesome to see and to witness. Um, support additionally came from the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, um, the University of Buffalo, and uh, we're uh, thrilled to be able to introduce to you tonight uh, Breakout. Thanks, um, and let me thank as well the Architecture Union for their support and um, for taking uh, a chance on us. Um, it came to them with this crazy project um, that in some ways I think um, is kind of antagonistic of architecture. I mean, the title, very title says Break Out of Your Office. Um, and if you look at how much attention has been spent over the last century to you know, building offices up, and building office buildings, and we're surrounded by hundreds of millions of square feet of office buildings here in Midtown. Um, but this is kind of a provocative um, experiment. Um, so Breakout basically starts with this fundamental premise, premise of um, what if your office was a park? What if you could um, work from anywhere? What if you could basically pick up whatever equipment you need to do or go down into a public place and be inspired, be challenged, be stimulated by that public place? This is a really personal um, thing for me. I work for a think tank that's based in California that won't pay for me to have an office here. They said, you move to New York, that's your personal choice. We have an office in California. So I have, for the last three years, um, struggled and hacked and tried to carve out different workplaces in the city. Um, and one of the inspirations for this project came um, February, about a year and a half ago. I kept finding myself taking conference calls in places where homeless people come, congregated. And it was because those were places where it was relatively quiet, you could sit and not be harassed. And I thought, oh my god, you know, these are great places to work. Um, so me and the homeless people were sort of, sort of bent on the same page there. If you look back um, in the history of the city, there's a really fascinating connection between the commercial life of the city and the streets and the public places of the city. This is um, a great picture um, of the New York Curb Market, or New York Curb Exchange, which is now the American Stock Exchange. If you go on, on uh, Greenwich Street, south of the Trade Center, look up, you'll still see on the side of the building it says New York Curb Exchange. They literally sold, bought and sold sh shares on the curb. The New York Stock Exchange was founded by an agreement called the Buttonwood Agreement because it was signed under Buttonwood Tree on Wall Street in the colonial days where um, traders used to meet to buy and sell shares. Um, I, I love looking at pictures of like the Lower East Side from the turn of the century. And every commercial activity possible, every human activity possible is taking place in that one photo of Orchard Street or Hester Street. Um, and so this is a really, you know, rich part of New York City's urban history. Um, and even, you know, beautiful um, uh, internationally acclaimed uh, commercial buildings, um, you know, have basically sucked all of that commercial energy up off the streets, out of the public places, and, and um, put it up into these structures that you know, I think you could argue originally <coughs> were um, designed as a very economical, efficient solution to organizing clerical work, okay? to getting lots of people and lots of paper 
uh, efficiently together um, so, that, so that they could you know, run these, these managerial um, uh, corporations that they were you know, coordinating operations all over the world, factories and things like that. We don't really do a lot of clerical work anymore. A lot of what we do in this city and the most productive uh, industries of this city is um, try to create things, try to create new knowledge, try to share your knowledge. Um, and so Breakout is really trying to um, not sort of question so much what goes on inside offices and workplaces, and this is where the auto-advancing slides start to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> but trying to understand, you know, if you completely remove that activity and try to put it back in the street, what would be some of the benefits? And to a degree, we sort of see this revolution already happening. Um, people are working in coffee shops, and Laura Forlano, um, who's on our team, has done an entire dissertation looking at this and, and what it means for organizations and work styles. <coughs> uh, people are taking their laptops and their cell phones and going down to parks like Bryant Park, um, which has had Wi Fi since 2003, and working there. And park managers recognize that it's okay, we're going to put little lecture fold over desks on 10% of the chairs to accommodate this new use in the park. Um, and then if you look at the total revolution um, that the social web has had on how people find each other, how they organize around interests, around places, um, not just hobbies like knitting or sailing or kayaking, um, around real serious creative knowledge work um, activities. Um, we're also deeply inspired by a couple different things that have been going on around the world. Um, Dana and I um, have been deeply involved in setting wireless um, parks up all around the city for, for many years now. Um, there's a whole network in lower Manhattan of wireless parks that we really helped build. Co-working, uh, Tony Bacigalupo is here. Um, he runs New York City, which is probably, I guess, the, um, the leading co-working space in Manhattan, um, down on Barrett Street in Tribeca, I guess it is. Um, and you know, co-working is basically freelancers coming together and pulling resources to share a space and create a community so that they don't have to sit in their apartments and work by themselves. And then Frank Duffy, um, founder of DEGW. Um, DEGW has been a big partner on this project, helping us think, you know, what um, from workplace design, um, the field of workplace design can help us understand how to, how to make the city um, into a comfortable place to work when you're on the go. Um, and so I think, um, you know, our big challenge has been how can we design an experiment that leverages all these components and all these trends um, and really starts to push on all the many different challenges. And we've had so many challenges um, trying to make the city a comfortable place to work. I set up this morning down in Wagner Park in the Battery, beautiful day, looking out across the harbor at the Statue of Liberty, um, trying to get on a conference call in a squadron of, of World War II relic aircraft, distant powered aircraft come flying over. I mean, like the loudest airplanes you've ever heard in your life. Um, and so, you know, this basically happens every time you get one of these. Uh, this is a great picture from when we did in front of the Apple Store in the meatpacking district in one of the new street plazas that uh, the DOT has built. And we just, we had this kit of parts which you can see downstairs. We said, hey, let's, let's just draw a line. And we drew a box around the tables we were working on. And we wrote city on one side and office on the other side. And it was just instantly clear to everybody that passed by what that meant. That we were working there and we had claimed that space. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn the presentation over to our team members. Um, they're going to do four more of these little lightning talks, uh, looking at the ethnography of mobile work and what we've learned from studying um, how people work in cafes and, and other trains and other places. Um, we're going to talk about how to design workplaces uh, in public space that drive innovation and drive creativity. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about another piece of our work, which is coming up with new meaning formats, um, things that leverage the fact that you're kind of coming together in this ephemeral gathering in a public place. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology infrastructure that's behind us, um, some of the tools, web tools, and network tools that we've taken and sort of recalibrated for our own purposes. And then I'll be back at the end just to let you know a little bit about where we're going next. Okay, so, Laura Formal. Thank you, Anthony. I'm Laura Colonna. I'm a social scientist. I study communication at Columbia, and my dissertation was on mobile work practices. So I've been looking at mobile work cultures uh, for the past three years, and before that, looking a lot at community wireless activism and um, trying to understand the linkages between social, technical, and spatial aspects 
Um, so that's really a thread that goes throughout my work. And this uh, presentation just will show you some of the highlights just in the past week of uh, our events that we've done, some of the quotes and some of the images that um, come to mind. I'm not quite sure how, how much, how longer, how much longer. Space space. Okay, all right, cool. Okay, so with, so with my dissertation research, um, I interviewed 30 mobile workers um, all over New York City, and what I found that I, that I thought was most striking and most interesting was the way in which people were reorganizing their work, um, both spatially and depending on the, the projects that they were working on. So one of my informants, Victor, had a pre-production space, a production space, and a deadline space, and all of them were Starbucks, and they were scattered throughout New York City. Um, there were various reasons why he had chosen those different spaces, including the availability of um, books at Barnes & Noble Starbucks, um, the availability of a social network at another uh, Starbucks at Astor Place, and then the deadline place in Koreatown, where he actually went when he needed to focus and get some work done. Um, the other story that comes to mind is the way he used that the um, production space as a central hub for his own innovation and pushing his own ideas. So he's a graphic illustrator and he had a constant stream of visitors that would look at his work and give him feedback. So he intentionally put himself out there and um, used that space in order to change uh, his understanding of his own work um, by putting himself out in the middle of his audience. This is a picture I took um, actually just yesterday and I think we can see that you know work um, has not always been confined uh, to offices and now we see the recession with new strategies that people are using to try to get hired. So this, I thought this very creative um, you know, placard that this gentleman had drawn up right um, at the base of Wall Street next to Trinity Church um, was an interesting example. So I guess what um, drew my attention was also the emergence of the co-working spaces and the ways in which people were starting to affiliate in membership-based uh, organizations of like-minded individuals and kind of moving away from firms as the primary um, place where they could find a working identity and towards a social network of like-minded um, individuals. All right. This is the persona, um, digital nomad persona that I created for the project, which um, based on a lot of the interviews I had done, really looked at um, the needs of mobile workers. So you can see in blue some of the highlighted um, concepts, like the temperature of a place is really important to making people comfort comfortable, the availability of Wi-Fi, the way that people are able to block out both private spaces um, and more public spaces, um, and use different settings like cafes and parks um, in their own way, really contextually relevant for their own work. Um, so if anything, what I found is not that work is you know, anytime, anywhere, but that it's deeply embedded in place and that each individual had their own rationale for the kinds of places that they chose and, and um, where they did their work. This is on display on stairs, right? Yep, yeah. exactly. Um, and this is a diagram that Antonina Semedi, <coughs> our wonderful internal lease proposal, created. Um, and the quote, the day that we did the field research, um, I spoke with a woman who said, uh, I work here every one, once every two weeks. I like the noise, if that makes sense. And she's a, an entrepreneur. She had her own office space, but she did enjoy, you know, once every couple of weeks going into this cafe setting to be, have a different kind of stimulation. She came with, you know, her, her cell phone, her agenda, her coffee mug, you know, set up under <coughs> the table, and then would often go and use the front entrance as her kind of phone booth and make private phone calls there. And this is also on display downstairs. Um, so from one of our very early breakout sessions last Saturday, um, we were hacking uh, or uh, jailbreaking the iPhone outside of the Apple store on 14th Street. And it was really ironic because a woman, a uh, stylish Asian woman, sat down next to us and she said, I don't use that Facebook, Twitter, what is it for? It does nothing. I don't understand how professionals are networking these days. I mean, I think this actually speaks to kind of the dramatic gaps in the ways that, say, uh, some younger professionals might be networking or professionals in certain industries like maybe tech and sort of the dramatic difference in uh, the ways that others are perceiving the use of these technologies for status updates um, or news, uh, following the news and all the various uses of these tools. 
Uh, this is the event, One Web Day, that we did on Tuesday, and not only bringing in these lightweight pieces of infrastructure, such as these laptop stands that are often used by DJs, um, but I think the other really important part of it is that in supporting One Web Day, we did um, really, uh, you know, I think clearly link this project to forms of open source peer production, and that is, in my mind, this, that is really what uh, the most interesting thing about putting work out there in semi-public or public kinds of settings is that barrier, uh, or breaking down the barrier that privatization and intellectual property rights have over our knowledge work and sort of by putting it out in public spaces have a different political relationship um, to the activity including collaboration and work. Um, and this is the event that we did yesterday in the Wall Street uh, public atrium. Um, and we were able to convene a group of about 15, including members of our team, students, professionals from various companies who were um, interested in, in what we were doing with mobile work and wanted to also tell us about their experiences with remote workers and their own um, employees. Um, and the reason that I love this space is because I do remember from my dissertation research, um, one, someone who actually was a very avid um, uh, user of this space for work and the reason that he did it was because he had to jump on the subway and go to his various tech appointments. So for him it was the ideal workspace because it was located right above a subway station. And then this week um, when I presented some of the project at SVA, uh, we've actually met a woman who does usability testing on the subway. She said her favorite place to work was a subway. It's because she's usability testing on various small mobile devices that are portable and she said she's able to focus there. So again, people find the spaces that where they're able to focus. Um, and then this morning actually I took my class um, out for an introduction to ethnography <coughs> session and we actually attracted two additional um, uh, members who registered on the Blake breakout platform and joined our class um, to do this ethnographic session. And when I asked um, uh, Patricia after the session why she had chosen to come that day, she said, uh, too much of my work is proprietary. I want to learn more about how ethnography is practiced in the design world. And, and that's my piece. I just wanted to um, flag uh, that what we're really doing with this project is coming up with new kinds of methodologies, new ways of studying mobile work. The Breakout OS is a really useful way to collect those live streaming data traces with the Twitter feeds and try to code them and analyze them, but it really requires thinking about social science research differently, um, and uh, the events that I'm going to be doing over the next couple of weeks are flash mob ethnography sessions, and it's really about applying peer-to-peer um, -peer production to the ethnographic method and see test the boundaries of that. I think I'm going to cheat and go backwards and then start the one minute again. <laughs> one minute per slide. <laughs> um, I'm Antonina Samedi and I work I'm a consultant with DEGW and we are um, a strategic design consultancy and we work mostly with corporate and academic organizations and these are inspired organizations who really put a premium on um, space, real estate, and design that actually helps them to meet business goals um, and helps their people to be innovative and creative. So I want to talk a bit about um, some of these organizations and some of the thinking that they're doing about mobility, mostly internal, but um, mobility in the city as well, and collaboration, um, and talk about how that's um, behind our thinking and participation breakout. Uh, this first example here, this is uh, GlaxoSmithKline. We do a lot of work with them and this is their innovation hub and this concept has been applied all over the world at this point point. and the idea here is a formal um, sort of a pairing of or, or setup of spaces, a variety of spaces that brings to teams together to collaborate um, across functions, across departments. The idea here is that people come together to work towards a common product or project, um, which is pretty innovative for this organization. And so you see at the top there is a project room where you've got finance people, you've got research people all working together in a, in a project room. They can appropriate the space, they can, you know, they take it over for the duration of the project, they can make it their own. Um, they're also sharing resources, which is very much a community 
concept. So nothing is assigned, and because they're all sharing spaces, you have to have a variety of spaces so that when you need some time to yourself to concentrate individual work, you've got a focus group that you, a focus booth you can go to that's on the bottom left. Um, this is the BBC Worldwide space in London, and this project here is an example of um, setting up a space to support ad hoc collaborations. And BBC Worldwide is actually the commercial arm of BBC and this was an opportunity for them to bring together all of the different businesses or departments within the BBC. And it's a great space where they've um, put an interactive media dome at the center. They've got a variety of spaces again at the bottom left, the sort of individual concentrative space. They've got the cafe space, the bar, the coffee bar where people can have sort of the ad hoc spontaneous interactions if they need. This is a um, amphitheater space for presentation, and all of this is public. So anybody that's coming in through the space, public to the BBC, um, people from different departments can come together and use the space. And it is being used in a variety of ways. Film production happens in this space. People are doing individual work. Even clients are coming and setting up and doing work in this space. Um, people are having meetings, so it's actually been quite successful. Then there's a category of organizations that are already highly mobile, um, management consultancies especially. So they're already thinking about the urban spaces that they can use for their own work. And I think that this is what's exciting about Breakout is that there's lots of opportunity to bring together corporate organizations that are already thinking about the external mobility, using uh, the city to work, and bringing them together with people who are already practicing mobile work and the co-workers, because when it comes down to it, the sort of, I think, design issues, technology issues even, are, are quite similar. So it's really exciting um, for us to have these conversations and bring people together and really come up with some new thinking about what the, the best way to make our cities more open um, to mobile work. Wow, I the minute there. <laughs> so we did some design thinking as part of part of Breakout, and we actually um, held, a, held a charrette, and we, um, you know, taking some findings from the research that um, we did with Laura, and visiting co-working spaces, and interviewing people, and um, we came together and had this exercise, and had sort of a set of design <coughs> criteria for what we wanted um, Breakout architecture to be, and what sort of mobile um, outdoor office environment or work environment should be. Um, so we went through a few iterations here. I'm going to start with the sort of heaviest intervention, and this was inspired by the uninspiring 8x8 traditional cubicle on the bottom left there, and we thought, well, what if you took that cube that's traditionally for one person and sort of exploded it, and, but it was this sort of self-contained unit that you can drop on a site, we're thinking about Bowling Green here in particular, you drop it on the site, it's got all of the pieces inside that you can take apart and actually create a work environment for up to 20 people rather than just one. Um, and this environment is adaptable, modular, you can um, move walls so that you can create spaces large or small depending on how many people you've got. There's an opportunity to um, network and have some social activities there at the bar. Um, and that this is, again, a self-contained environment that um, sort of replicates the office environment in a public setting. Um, this is a bit of a lighter weight intervention that we thought about that's really based on a couple of simple concepts that to work you need a surface, so you've got an adjustable surface here, um, and you need seating, and you need shade, which is what people talked a lot about. So we were thinking about, um, you know, inspired by some of the work that we've done with academic organizations, that sort of flexible learning environment in the bottom left there. Um, we thought about a space, an underutilized public space like Edgar Plaza that's got some infrastructure already in place, which I think is pretty attracted actually, and um, thought about what sort of mod um, flexible furniture we could drop in the space that again would let you support the range of work activities that happen typically in meetings, presentations, and social um, events, networking, and uh, if you can see in the back there someone's actually sitting on his laptop working alone. Um, this was the most lightweight of our infrastructure interventions, and in this case we kept hearing throughout the, the research that um, having shade is really the biggest problem when you're out working in public environments. So this is, you know, we were inspired by dragons and umbrellas and decided that this, this intervention would just be a way to simply outline space. So we were thinking of uh, space in the city, that's Broad Street, um, 
cafe tables that are set up there, and that's managed by Downtown Alliance. And so the furniture there, the surface and seating to do work is already there. So in that case, we thought about providing some way to define the space that's movable depending on how many spaces you're in it, but that differentiates it from the rest of the urban space and opportunities to create walls if necessary, um, or even a projection surface um, for sharing. What we ended with, and what we decided ultimately fit the story of Breakout in New York, actually, is this kit of parts that Anthony um, has already talked about that's on display downstairs. And really what the kit is, is a tool to help you be completely mobile. So this backpack of tools that we put together has um, both functional and sort of symbolic tools in it um, to support work anywhere in the city. So we've got the tools that help you, the technology tools, the tools that will help you access um, the internet. We've got sort of the typical uh, traditional office collaboration tools like a mini whiteboard. We've got flip charts. We've got post-its. Um, we've got some sort of symbolic elements. There's the red hat. So if you don't actually have a place to work in private, you put on a red hat and that suggests, you know, don't bother me. I'm concentrating right now. We put in some chalk, which we used outside the Apple Store, like Anthony said, to use um, to actually delineate space. And people were really have been really receptive to that, and you actually don't need the architecture to do it. Um, and that's it. We're really excited to actually continue the design thinking. And I'm just going to give a plug for a couple of other breakout sessions. One is actually a design show <coughs> that we're hosting on October 6th, and that's going to be at um, Madison Square Park at the Shake Shack. And that's for two reasons. One is because we want to continue the design thinking and we've invited, you know, from product designers all the way through architects to help us do that thinking, but also people say, design, how do you do that outdoors? So we're going to test it out and see how we can actually do some sketching and design work outside. Um, and another session that we're hosting is um, we're inviting sort of urbanists and planners and economic development and business development experts and helping, getting them to help us think about how the city as a whole can be more open and um, receptive to mobile work and co-working. So I think I encourage you to attend them. Thanks. Hi folks, I'm Sean. I've been in G2 because I'm just out of time now. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, I'm here from San Francisco. I'm the only person here who's actually from across the country. But I'm here because this really brings together a lot of the things I've worked on in the past. I um, I started. I studied basically how Wi-Fi is changing the way people use cafes in Seattle and in San Francisco and in Berkeley. It depends how research Seattle and Berkeley. And then I actually started a startup that was all about the use of Wi-Fi in public places and encouraging people to work in new ways in these places. And I also two years ago founded a co-working space called Paris South of Market, which is again it's a it's a new form of place. Um, in the city, which there's actually 10 of these co-working spaces in San Francisco now. We're not alone. And there's some like Tony's here in New York, which are really exploring new forms of work in the city. So this really brings all these things together. And you know, one of the driving forces of this, you know, one of the things I really think that I got excited and passionate about with this project is that in with bar camps and with co-working spaces and all these new things that are going <coughs> on, people are not really sharing best practices yet in terms of the structure in terms of formats, what works best, you know, what doesn't work so well. And when people come together for more cooperative forms of work and outside of the traditional offices, more public spaces. And so as part of this project, we're pulling together some of those best practices and experimenting with new forms of work and seeing what works well, what doesn't work well. And as a takeaway from this, we're actually going to have this online where anybody can come and find out about these formats and use them and contribute to them and test them out beyond what we're doing this week. So there's a whole lot of them out there, but just to start with, a, just to highlight a few in particular that are interesting that we're looking at. <laughs> One of them is business speed dating. Just what happens if you take the concept of speed dating and apply it to a networking session? Or, you know, instead of just an old-fashioned cocktail mixer, what if you actually have people paired up and, you know, present even a very short period of time, maybe two minutes, what is it that I have to offer? And what is it that I want to get most out of this you know, sort of cocktail or networking gathering? And then have each pair break apart, everybody move on and form new pairs. And then at the end of that session, once everybody has talked to everybody on the other side of the tables, then you can have a more traditional you know, cocktail gathering. But it's supercharged because people already have the preconceptions in mind of 
you know, what everybody else is about, who I have good chemistry with in terms of the business sense, and you know, who, we can, who to go back to and reconnect for more productive, longer term partnerships. Another one is pair programming. <laughs> there was an article in the New York Times just last week about this. Was it earlier this week or last week? Anyway, this is kind of revolutionizing the world of software development. It's, it's a particular sort of work format that's emerged. And it's all about taking programmers who used to do their work very much alone and very solitary, putting them in pairs, and taking on two roles. One person is the driver, one person is the navigator. And the driver sits there and just, um, line by line, just codes out the software. And the navigator thinks about the bigger picture. You know, the driver does the tactical stuff. The navigator thinks about how does this fit into the big picture and our goals. Also watching for, you know, typos and errors, things like that. And it turns out this really frees up. Those are two sorts of styles of thinking. And if the driver doesn't always have to think about, oh, am I making typos? How does this fit into the big picture? They can just work much faster and vice versa. And so then they switch roles. You know, in different periods. And um, usually it's not a cat. It's not usually two people. But uh, I just wanted to make sure you guys were paying attention. But, but so, what, what can this be applied? The statistics on this are amazing. It's if, what if you could apply just a simple format to your day to day work and see a 40% increase in productivity of what it is that you do it, what you get out of the end of the day, and a 15% decrease in errors. This has been proven quantifiably. You can ask me for a citation afterwards. I can point you to the studies of this. It really works well in coding. But can we apply this to other writers? What about writers? What about accountants? What about, you know, totally different forms of work other than programming? So that's one of the things we're looking to experiment with. Another one is block breaking, creative block breaking. Everybody knows that feeling. When you're in your day-to-day -day work and you come to a point where you just, you're batting your head up against the wall over and over with something. You're too close to the problem. You've been staring at this problem and you can't see a way around it. Hypothesis is that what if you take this person who's having this problem, pull them out of that setting, that same boring office that they are in every single day where this block arose to begin with, drop them down in a change of venue, change of scenery, maybe an outdoor space that gets the creative juices flowing. You put the problem in front of different people who are not too close to the problem, or even in totally different industries and make the person actually summarize the problem in a way that can be explained and understood in layman's terms, so outsiders can understand it. And then, you know, the, the, theory, the hypothesis is that since different disciplines see things from different lenses, that they can spot new solutions to these problems, and people can help each other to break out of creative impasses this way through the use of public spaces. Another format is lightning talks, and that's what this is. This is something that became very popular in Tokyo amongst the uh, the architecture scene, you know, building architecture, and as well as product developers years ago through something called the Pecha and Kucha sessions. And then it was adapted. Now it's really popular in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco and in the tech like startup scene across the country. It's really spreading. And it's basically it's this. It forces you to get up and present an idea in a very brief period of time and be very concise and have visual aids like this. And you're out of timer, so you're actually forced to be really concise. And so often at the beginning of these sessions, everybody gets up, presents something that's on their mind. It's either an opportunity or a challenge or something of interest. And then they get down, and the next person comes up. So by the end of a sh fairly short period of time, everybody has a bunch of interesting new ideas in their heads. And they can reconnect in kind of a cocktail mixer setting to, to build upon those ideas.
practitioners of co-working, uh, and also as a social scientist that has in the past looked at uh, work as a social activity. Uh, and that's actually something that I think is very interesting uh, as we look at all of the stuff that Breakout is trying to accomplish. It's very important for us to remember that fundamentally we're all human beings and fundamentally we like to interact with one another mostly. Uh, and ultimately work, even though it's not considered as such by, um, by overwhelming the, the overwhelming majority of the population, work is a fundamentally social activity. And the best workplaces are those that uh, promote and uh, help to accomplish social interaction because it helps to bring the people together. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how the software and the technology help to accomplish creating a more social outdoor work environment. Uh, that's not what people traditionally consider to be the result of this, which is a Wi-Fi hotspot. This is a mobile hype Wi-Fi hotspot that fits in your pocket. We build these uh, through NYC Wireless in a bunch of city parks around uh, a bunch of parks around the city. Uh, but the traditional expectation of these types of devices is that you get a bunch of people sitting around focused on the 13 inch uh, brightly lit uh, rectangle in front of them and not about around all of the context that is surrounding them and obviously the particularly beautiful context that the New York City parks provide. Um, but to do work you overwhelmingly need the internet and this is, uh, this is how we provide it. Uh, there's actually a, uh, there's actually a battery attached to that device uh, and a uh, little cellular modem and actually we walked around the city uh, and got an internet access just about anywhere that you know you want to sit yourself down which is pretty neat. Um, but the, the main thrust of my work with Breakout has been to, to build the operating system that, uh, that powers Breakout. Technologists talk about operating systems as the fundamental software layer that sits between the hardware is the Wi-Fi access point, and all of the software and applications that people need to use to do their work and play and all of that. Uh, and in this case, we view the Breakout OS really as the operating system for break, the Breakout style of work and for a lot of co-working and a lot of uh, collaborative interactive work. Uh, and it really is a an operating system in, in a sense that it sits between the hardware of the Wi-Fi device and the software which is the actual process of work that goes on within the breakout session. So uh, just to give you a quick overview of how this actually works, uh, we have sessions. Uh, this is a session page. Every breakout session is defined by a menu and a particular span of time. Uh, and that's, and, and it can have also a session format as well. In this case, uh, this is a, uh, actually I don't even know what kind of session this was. This uh, is one web day. Oh, this is one web day. Okay. Oh yeah, the session update. This is, uh, this is a one web day event. Um, but the session format describes the style of work. And as Sean was describing, the style of work can take a number of different formats, uh, some of which are about forming uh, groups of people around a single solitary uh, goal or accomplishment, and others are about breaking, the, breaking into smaller groups or just accomplishing an individual task, with, it, but having uh, available to you the collaborative uh, interactions that a breakout session can provide and that a good office can provide. I use office in the, the theoretical term, not necessarily the physical term. Um, so each breakout session has, uh, has a venue. This is, a, for example, the, uh, the Washington Square venue. Uh, and this is where we held that previous breakout session. And one of the things that these pages provide that we discovered is very useful is contextual information about what surrounds you. So when you go into an office, you know where the bathrooms are. You can ask if there's usually water or something to drink there. There's you know, places to get food. Uh, there's uh, interesting, there may be a, communications tools around there. Uh, when you go into Washington Square Park, you don't have any of that stuff. So if you're going to transform Washington Square Park into a workplace, then you need to provide a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of this, these tools, much like Antonina talked about the actual breakout uh, backpack that provides the actual 
uh, work tools, these are the tools that, that create the context around which work can happen. Um, the session archive provides some information about past sessions, and this is actually interesting in that the whole point of the breakout OS is to uh, create documentation around what goes on at a particular breakout session. Uh, and uh, publish that documentation, uh, possibly for the world to see, but to create, a, uh, but create, to create a fixed record of what actually went on there so that someone can come back and uh, relive to a certain extent the actual experience of that breakout session and review the accomplishments that were, uh, that were made at that particular breakout session. Uh, the tool actually functions by listening to uh, all sorts of social interaction. Now, this is an example of how you actually cr go and create your own breakout session. And that, this was actually one of the things that was very important for the experience was that we wanted to invite everyone to come in and host their own sessions. And we had a few that were hosted yesterday, for example, a professor at NYU, Tom Igo, actually hosted a breakout session for his class outside of uh, the Google building, which also happens to be the biggest telecom hotel in New York City, where he, uh, where he used chalk to diagram out on the street how the internet works for his class. And he actually transformed the street corner into his classroom teaching environment. Uh, and uh, to, to some of the stuff that Sean talked about, that really sort of gets you out of the fixed environment of, le of the lecture hall and places you instead in, into a much more, a much different type of context, physical context, to help you understand and experience the learning in a, in a totally different way. Um, the primary aspect of Breakout, though, are these session pages. And uh, basically what they do is chronicle exactly what goes on at a Breakout session. And I think one of the most important and interesting inventions or discoveries that we had about how to create these these pages or how to create this documentation was that it wasn't so important to capture just the the solitary import the solitary contextual topical uh, things that people were saying online and uh, and about what about the the particular uh, goals of the meeting or of the breakout session but rather to capture the greater context of everything that people were doing at that venue within that span of time uh, when operating uh, with all of those people uh, and capture that as the over, overall context of the actual happenings at the breakout session. And, uh, as a social scientist, I sort of look back at you know, what happens in the physical world uh, and think about how that translates into an online context. And, when you're working in a physical office, a lot of what goes on there are a lot of these side conversations and a lot of these side contexts. And it's very important that we recognize that that is part of what makes the office a social space and a lot of what we need to make sure that we, uh, that we accomplish and bring along with us when we transform uh, a physical outdoor space into a workspace as well. So, So, um, where are we going from here? I mean, I think you've heard a little bit about each of the three big uh, work streams, essentially, that have been part of this project. Um, picking out sites and thinking about how to transform them physically into workspaces. Um, thinking about what we're actually going to do in those spaces and the kinds of meetings and sessions that we're going to have. Um, and then some of the supporting technology infrastructure that we want to use to, to power that and, and stitch it all together. Each of those pieces, um, right now we're in the process of sort of digesting this first week of breakout sessions. We've done it, probably about a dozen of them over the last seven days. We're all totally exhausted. <laughs> we're going to go downstairs and have some cocktails and unwind with everybody. Um, but we've been documenting this stuff extensively. So we're using a couple lightweight web tools. Um, Drop.io, which is a great site built by an entrepreneur here in New York City, which is it's like the easiest way to share files on the internet. Um, you can create drops for anything in seconds. It's a great site. Um, and then we're just using a wiki um, to sort of openly and collaboratively um, log experiences, insights, best practices. We've got people from other cities around the world that are starting to peek at this stuff. And um, we're actively working with a group uh, in Barcelona, um, a, a sort of combination think tank, university research center, community center there, 
um, called City Lab. We're actually going to be sending um, a couple of the team members over there uh, in October for a big um, EU-sponsored event called Urban Labs. Um, this is City Lab here on the right. It's actually in an old industrial town in the suburbs of Barcelona. Um, that's sort of the extreme of the second phase of breakout that we're starting to move into in the next week or two, um, which is sort of codenamed internally Breakout of Manhattan. Um, and that's sort of the central <laughs> gathering point for a lot of us um, because of work, because of where we live. Um, but we want to take this to other places and we're, we're sort of leveraging the co-working movement um, to do that. So Breakout of Manhattan, we're going to be getting on trains, getting on buses, in some cases getting on planes, and going to these co-working hubs all around the region and around the world uh, and sharing with them what we've learned, hoping that they will become places that then kind of evangelize this practice in their community. So we're going to go to um, Philadelphia, to Indy Hall, which is a really um, very successful uh, co-working um, facility right near um, Independence Hall, um, you know, where the Declaration of Independence was signed. We're going to be going to upstate New York, taking a two-hour ride on Metro North of the Hudson Valley Line with the, the mobile Wi-Fi router, working all the way up, do something with those guys, and then um, take the train back. Um, and then we're also going to be uh, having a breakout session, uh, not next Friday, but Friday after, at the Rooftop Garden on the um, Treehouse Brooklyn co-working space in downtown Brooklyn, which is all about um, freelancers and entrepreneurs who are interested in sustainability and sustainable design. So we're hoping to sort of um, you know, engage in a dialogue with this movement of people that are already really open to new ways of working and new ways of collaborating, um, and push these different work streams ahead and try and share the information. Um, and one of the things I think will be the most interesting, um, we've working with a group in Barcelona, uh, we've got people in Germany and other, other countries that are interested in doing this on their own. Um, and they very aggressively sort of started to remix the concept on their own. And we're hoping that um, this is something that, you know, just like good place design or good architecture is going to get contextualized in, in different uh, places and different cultures and different traditions and then echoed back at us over the internet. Uh, I'll be very curious to see, you know, what co-working in Japan is like, or co-working in South Africa, I'm sorry, uh, breakout in South Africa uh, looks like, and what the issues and challenges are there. Um, and so that's it, that's our project. It's a lot of fun, and we invite all of you to come participate. We're going to start opening up features on the site soon. You can already schedule your own sessions, um, but you can have your own venues. So if somebody has a really interesting venue where you want to have a site, can contact us and we'll put it in there and then you can schedule your session. Um, and we can register for events that are in there. Um, and everything is at breakoutfestival.org. So thank you. Um, questions for anybody, uh, or we can go straight into <laughs> <laughs>